you're a multi billionaire European founder who's moved to Gandhinagar. Yes. Why did you choose Gujarat in India? We have a rule at to do is we never go to tier 1 cities. We always go to tier 2 cities because that's where we can have a better retention of employees. No one's ever said that on this show. They should. Tell me from the perspective you had before you actually went to China. Why did you choose that country and what was the reality check? Before you we went to China, I saw China like India. But then the problem is in China is that first you cannot open a company in China. A company in China has to be owned by a Chinese person. If you have to choose one country to invest, it is India. And if I have to choose a second one, I would pick India too. Really? Yes, there is no other country with that level of opportunities. For the other foreigner founders, you know, founders from other countries who want to expand in this country. What's your advice to them? Book a flight ticket and come there a few weeks, meet people and in the end are very entrepreneur mindset. So you will find good relationship that you can start uh, using and developing. You're a very memorable guy. <laughs> like if you've done so much in life and you're so humble, you know I find that very crazy man because I don't like saying this, but you don't see too much of that in India. As I'm recording this intro, Mr. Fabian Ponker has just left our studio after a 3 hour conversation i rarely stretch conversations up to the 3 hour mark unless i truly feel like i'm extracting value out of my guest created a business conversation on the podcast after a very long time because this business story is very very interesting as you saw in the trailer it's about a self made billionaire who now finds himself in gujarat in india because he's trying to expand his business operations while he sits in gandhinagar so of course we spoke about expanding business within india but he's had the experience of living in america of trying to expand his business in china so it's a very global business oriented conversation if you're an indian viewer you're going to learn about your country once again but from a foreigner's perspective from a very very successful founder's perspective and if you're someone who's looking at india as a possible place you'd like to expand your own business ventures this is the ultimate 101 that i could bring forward for you all the questions were centered around extracting value for business owners and people who want to learn more about international markets it's a very deep podcast it's also a lot of fun because fabian's personality is very easy going he is one of europe's youngest billionaires ever but he speaks from a very humble very practical place enjoyed speaking with him and i'm sure you're going to enjoy on the special episode of the ranveer show Fabian hello how are you i'm good uh i need to be very honest with you before we start talking i love talking to foreigners on my podcast it's okay. a lot of fun <laughs> and for us it's good too for me it's the first time in india so but you've been here for 9 months yeah i'm living in india but uh, i've never done a show i was focusing on my business i will begin this podcast with a very simple question came cho um majama gujarati <laughs> bolocho <laughs> in din din todo todo i find it so fascinating that you know gujarati dude uh, just a little bit how long have you been in gujarat 9 months and you've been in amdavad ha uh, gandhinagar gandhinagar how are you liking life in india ah uh, it's amazing yeah i really love it it's uh, it's an experience not everything is easy things are difficult but they are really good things so i really like it Dude what I find crazy about you is you have had a 20 year entrepreneurial career then you've traveled all over the world and now you're targeting India as a place for expansion and yes. you're you're the founder of your startup but the founder himself is now sitting in India to try to expand into this market yeah even the people uh, so I come from Belgium even the people of Belgium don't understand why I came to India I had to explain them they they are calling me the slum dog billionaire <laughs> <laughs> because they imagine India like uh, yeah. because they don't know of course yeah um but I'm really glad I did it because uh, the business has been amazing experience has been very good as a, for the family so really good okay what else tell me about your life how's a day in your life in India 
Uh, it's great, depending. There are some good and bad stuff. The worst is the weather. I mean, the summer is just crazy in India. Too hot. It's way too hot. For me, uh, you know, in Belgium today, it's like minus 10 degrees <laughs> Celsius. <laughs> so uh, when you get the summer at 45, 50 plus in India, it's it's very hot, very difficult. Um, but um, what I like about India is, uh, you know, you live with nature, nature with uh, animals. Uh, in, in Europe, you don't have animals in the street anymore. Mm. Even... even um, uh, of course, you don't have cows and and dogs, but even birds. There are so less birds compared to here. So it's wow. nice feeling to to live with uh, nature and, and and animals. That's what you notice here that there's more. Yes, yeah, the first thing you notice in the street when you walk <laughs> in the street. Second thing is there are way too many people. <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah, but I think you get the opposite. If you go to Europe, you probably uh, feel alone yeah. and in danger because there is not that much people around you. Danger depends on where you are in Europe, but you do feel in a very positive way, isolated, mm -hmm. which actually calms down your head. Like it's, it's one of my favorite places to travel to because I know when I come back, I'm going to be very relaxed. <laughs> so it's a very relaxing place. That's yes. what I'll say about Europe. Uh, I find it crazy that you're actually thinking about staying in India for a long time. Yes. What's in your mind? What's in your heart about like staying here? Uh, so I came for the business. Um, we went to a point where for do, um, what we get in India was not mature enough. We had a lot of activities, a lot of partners. We had something like 40,000 uh, developers on our software, on Odoo in India, but they were not selling on the Indian market. They were selling in the, in the US and in Europe. So it, it was for me like a big opportunity that we didn't tap in. You mean all your developers, your coders? Not only ours, because we only have uh, 4,000 employees, but we work with partners Got who it. are companies offering services on our product. And we had a lot of partners in India but they were not addressing the Indian market. They were just looking outward to sell They were the selling world. development services uh, in the US and in Europe. Um, and I wanted to refocus that on the domestic market because India's uh, SMEs is big. Uh, GDP is growing at 8% uh, per year. Uh, so it's a massive market, one fifth of the world population. So you cannot c close your eye to, to such a big and future economy. So I came here in order to develop the local market. You know, in order to understand you better, why don't you introduce your own life's work a little bit before I ask you more questions about India and Europe? Okay, well, yeah, <laughs> probably the right way to start. Yeah, because people, especially business-oriented audiences, which is a big chunk of YouTube audiences now, are very interested to know about how the world looks at India and about how you want to sell in India and why do you want to sell here? Because honestly, Indians, if you look at it from a mass scale, are not easy customers. They're difficult customers to win over. Mm. So I want to get into all those tangents about all your challenges you faced here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But let's begin with a little bit about your story. Yes, so you began as a coder. Yeah, I was a developer, uh, engineer. I started to, and I I, I, I love business. So I was reading uh, two, two, three books uh, about management, psychology, to develop my business every week. Um, I did a lot of things and this one, which is a do uh, work better than the others. Uh, so I started alone after two years, I had one employee after three years, three, four, five. This is in 2004 you began. That was in 2002. Yes. Yeah. When I was still a student and then I grew, uh, organically bootstrapped the company. Uh, I started to sell services on this software. So the software is, is a management software. At the beginning I was selling services. So I asked Alain, what do you want? And I was developing everything. And I did that until to, to 2010. And at that time, I had a software that had a lot of features because I developed everything the customer would ask for. <laughs> so it was full of features, but ugly, complex, uh, and everything. Uh, and at that time, I had uh, 100 employees. Um, so I decided to do a pivot in the business model and say, we cannot do service and develop everything people need. We need to focus as a software vendor and develop a clean product uh, um, and do not, not develop for customer, but develop what's good for the mass. So for eight years, you got requests from businesses. They asked you to develop softwares which would help their individual business problems. Yes. And eventually you developed so many softwares that you realized, hey, hold on. I can actually turn this into a tech product yes. and probably make it more profitable than what we're doing. Yes, um, it was a bet because uh, I, from one day to another, I decided to stop services, stop all revenues. I had 100 employees and say, okay, now we'll focus on something else we'll create a network of partners, they will do the service, and we will sell maintenance. 
So from and one day to another, you will sell what? Maintenance service, oh, so okay. support, uh, bug fix, upgrade. Mm. And that was risky because we would stop all our activities from one day to another to refocus on something else. So I raised three millions of euro uh, with French VCs at the time, uh, so that we can do the pivot in the business model and say, okay, no, let's refocus on making a clean product. And um, that's when the, the adventure of Odoo started. The mindset has always been the same: is to develop business apps to help companies be more efficient, more productive. Got it. From a, a first-time entrepreneur's perspective, what I'd like to say is that a first-time entrepreneur has a lot of random business challenges that you don't anticipate mm. in, like accounting, like uh, HR management, and the list goes on. So. I th- your software handles all those miscellaneous business problems as well. Yeah. So uh, the, the, what is Odoo today? Uh, it's a suite of business apps. We have applications for pretty much everything SMEs need. Like you need an accounting software, we have one. A CRM, we have one. You need to create a website, we have a website builder. Mm. You need an inventory management software with barcode scanner, beep, 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 and you receive deliver, we have one app. And if you put all these apps together, you have a fu- fully integrated company. And, um, and that's what we do. We offer tools to small and mid-sized companies so that they, they can perform better. What I find crazy about this is that you have a lot of data with you also. So you will be able to understand how different countries go about business in different ways. Yes, yes. We have uh, 12 millions of users. So it's probably the most installed management software out there, ERP at least. Um, so, and we are active in, we do accounting for 150 countries. So we are one of the largest uh, spread uh, in terms of different countries. You're a brave guy. Uh, I'm just a good worker. <laughs> <laughs> As in you're just a hardworking guy. I'm hardworking. For the first seven years, I didn't get a single day of holiday for seven years. And I was working like 14 days, 14 hours a day. It's not anymore the case. No Saturday and Sunday, I, I work less, but uh, getting older. <laughs> <laughs> you think that plays a role? I think I don't have the same level of energy. Yeah, I, uh, I feel that already between uh, 22 and 30. How old are you? I'm 30. Oh, you have time. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel a difference in the energy I felt when I was 22. Yeah, I wait for 40. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be horrible. <laughs> I'm 44. Really? <laughs> yes. How do you look so young, dude? Um, I don't know. It's good to know <laughs> that I look young. Good genetics. Yes. Uh, God, you're a happy guy on the inside. Ah, I'm super happy. I love my job. I love my company. I love my product. I'm really happy in life. What are you the happiest about from a business perspective about your whole business career? Um, so the, what I do like is that what we do as is super important uh, because it helps companies, uh, it helps people. We don't do management software for managers or for managing companies. I'm not interested in that. It's not interesting. I do tools so that every employee in, com- in the companies can do their job better, can save time, do less administrative tasks, less boring tasks. So we really help millions of people having a better life. Because if you think about it, you probably spend 30, 40 percent of your time at work. So better do it with good tools so that you enjoy doing rather than doing boring administrative re-recording of data. And I feel like we have a massive impact on, uh, on the society because of that. We do it with, a, we didn't talk about it, but with a special business model, which is open source. So a lot of people can get it for free, download, modify. And so we are reaching countries that could not afford that kind of software because it's free. Uh, so the impact is really big of what we do. Can you explain what open source means, one? And two, why did you make it open source? Because it's a very different mentality. Like if you have built out a product, if you've built out a software, uh, there has to be an intention behind turning it into an open source software. Yeah. Open source is you've kept the software available for the public. Yes. So open source is a license that says instead of constraining the software and say, when you buy my software, you have minimum 10 user, maximum 10 user, you have this, 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 this. Instead of putting constraints, we put rules so that we guarantee the user that they will be able to use the software for free, um, get the source code of the software so they can learn it modify it for free and all the things will be free forever. So it's like a protection for the user. And the reason I did open source is because I'm passionate about open source since I was a student. I only use myself open source software. So when I developed software, I did it open source. Because you get a template from which you can build upon? No, because I I, I, did, I didn't want it to do another model. It was something I was, I'm passionate about that. I'd like to, I think 
software is knowledge and knowledge should be shared. Mm. And I think short software is like knowledge should be shared to the world. Um, and I think it's better. It was very hard because when you do a software for free, getting money out of that is really difficult. So it took me uh, maybe 15 years to understand the business model. What is the business model? Um, nowadays, so I tried everything. I started as a service company, as I explained to you. Then I moved to maintenance, selling service like support, upgrade. Um, didn't work that well. It worked, but uh, after 500 employees, I couldn't. I was, I had, I've had like seven years close to back bankruptcy. So at some point, I said, okay, I have to change. <laughs> My passion about open source is good, but at some point, it's good to remain alive too. Um, and so now the business model that works is what we call open core. And an open core business model is where you have 80% of the applications are free and open source. And we add 20% of application where you have to pay for. Freemium. It's like a freemium, but it's like two different products. Some people can just use the open source one and others uh, can use the, what we call a do enterprise, which is the full version. That's the one which is working for you right now? Yes. For example, if you need a CRM, it's open source, it's free. You need a website, free and open source. You need inventory, sales, purchase, it's free and open source. You need accounting, you will have to pay the accounting version because it's only in the paid version. So people gain trust in your software from the free part and then they're like, yeah, this is a good software. Design is great. Functionality is great. Let me pay for like this additional. Uh, yes, some do that. 10%. 90% doesn't pay. Never pay. But the best is the word of mouth. You know, when you build a company, the most difficult part is marketing, word of mouth, building a big audience of users and... And the good thing when you are free is that you quickly get millions of users. And uh, even though they will never pay, some of them, what they will do is bring you uh, more customer because they will tell to their friend, this uh, software is great, I'm using it every day, you should check it. And maybe one of them will pay. So based on those 10% parts of your software that are actually premium, which people pay for, you're supporting the whole business. Yes. Including the 90%, which is free. Yes. Damn. For me, it was a very philosophical problem because... I was passionate about open source and I did not want it to sell proprietary source of software. I was against that. Uh, but it was a very bad decision. It was a very bad mindset because at the time I had something like maybe 100 developers maximum. I couldn't pay more. Um, and now that I have 10% non-open source or 20% non-open source, 80% open source, I can afford paying hundreds of developers. Uh, so I contribute way more to the open source world than what I did before, even though I'm not 100% open source today. So it's something I didn't understand. It took me years because I refused that. But once I did that, I switched the business model and then the company started to skyrocket. You know, there's a lot of lessons that Indian entrepreneurs, young Indian entrepreneurs can actually learn from this mm -hmm. in terms of your selling to the world. Here we, a lot of us have dreams about selling to the world as well, but I don't think we're educated in that aspect in terms of if you've built out something in India, how do you ensure that someone sitting in Britain or Nigeria or Brazil would actually use your stuff? So you, you've had an expansion outside your own country, right? Yes. Uh, you know, we are Belgians. Belgium is nothing. It's 10 million of people. <laughs> so by nature, if you want to do business, we are forced to export because our market is nothing. Um, you don't have the same issue in India, but you have also a lot strong incentive to export. Uh, in software, it's easy. It's just build the best software. The reason Odoo works is we have the best. Uh, you have We have the best CRM. We have a modern website builder, web, much better than WordPress or, or Zoho or, or Shopify. Uh, and we build the best. It took us 20 years, but once you get the best, software is like compound interest. You build and you build and you build. Wow. Everywhere it gets better and better and better. And the revenue you get from the software increase exponentially based on what you build. It's like uh, creating a massive asset that is generating more and more revenue over the years. But it takes time. Mm. It takes a lot of time because in order to be the best, uh, you, have, you have to develop and develop and develop. Especially in open source. In open source, it's very hard because, you know, in property software, when you sell the software on a license, you can have a lot of competitors. And they will all differentiate themselves. Open source is like a transparent market. Um, it's like, because it's free, everyone will test before buying. So they test, they play with it. And so everyone will choose the best product. So in the open source, it's a winner takes all market. There is one winner, but no second player. Mm. And that is very hard. So it requires for you to invest a lot in research and development, um, in order to build the best product. And before you, you are the, not the best, you, you get just small amounts. 
But once you beat, once you are the number one, you have a, like a consolidation effect where everyone looks at you and you grow faster. And to further your consolidation and your profits, you basically have to play a numbers game. You need more and more people to use your free of cost yes. stuff. And because it's open core model, I cannot charge as much as the other. You know, the, the big ERPs like Microsoft Dynamics, uh, SAP, uh, Oracle, NetSuite, they charge a lot, like $180 per user per month. They can because they charge for the full amount of the software. For us, it's different. We have 80% which is open source and only 20% which is proprietary. So if we charge the full amount, people will say, oh, for 20% less, I can get everything for free. So I won't buy that. Our main competitors is yourself, is your open source product. So we have to charge at one fifth of the under because we all can only charge a small layer, which is for a fee, which means we have to compensate with big volumes. Mm. Which is also partly why India? Um, no and yes. For me, up to no. So it changed one year ago. The role of India for us changed one year ago. Before, India was like the service provider for the world. So the local market in India was nothing. We had only a few users, but they were selling development services to all our partners all around the world because in Europe, in the US, we are lacking developers. So they were all subcontracting to Indian partner. So India at the beginning helped us a lot to provide services we couldn't afford in the other countries. Now it changed. Since one year, that's the reason why I came here. Uh, we, our main focus is the local market because they are like uh, old school software like Tally that we need something modern to replace. And the, the, the local market is big, growing fast. So now since one year, we decided, okay, now it's time to focus on selling on to Indian companies. In rupees, how much does your... Uh, so Odoo is, the way we work is that one app is free. So you need a website, free. Forever, unlimited users with domain name, everything free. You need a CRM, free. You need an accounting software, free. You need a electronic signature to sign the contract, free. But if you need more application, if you need uh, all of them, so all the application is like something like 80 different applications to run your whole business, that's 580 rupees per month. That's it? That's 580 rupees per month per user, yes. Per it's, user? It's cheap, huh? yeah, it's still very cheap. So in a company, how many users end up? Depends on the company. You could have a company of 50 people, 10 users. Hmm. So one fifth of the company. The price is not an issue. Yeah, it's uh, 580 rupees is pretty much nothing for yeah. what they get for. What challenge are you facing with expanding in our country? Um, the main one is marketing. It's um, uh, because we were known from developers, but we were not known from businessmen. So Odoo uh, had a lot of developers in India, but business were not using because developers were focusing on selling to Americans. Mm. Um, and so now we have to say, hey, we, have, uh, we are here, so we are ready to support and serve you. That's one. The other one is we had to adapt the product. Uh, we had to put a price in rupees, decrease our price. I, we really had to do a lot of things to adapt to the Indian market. Um, like we had to change our accounting to be GST compliant, TDS, TCS, uh, <laughs> Damn, dude. Uh, all those things. So we did that la last year uh, to meet all the Indian needs. Uh, as an MNC owner, like a multinational company owner, what have you learned specifically about the Indian market? Um, it's very price sensitive. Uh, you know, when you work with an American, they will want the beautiful software and they will pay whatever the price. They want the best, beautiful, clean software. In the end, they ask the price first. How much does it cost without having seen the software? So it's a very price sensitive market. You, are in, you, ha you could have the best software in the world. You have to be at an affordable price. Um, it's a fast deciding market. So like in Europe, oh, the worst is Africa. Africa, they take, they take months to decide. <laughs> Europe, it's okay. India is a little bit faster. Um, you know what we do, transform companies. So it's massive impact on the companies. So we have sales cycles could be one, three months for small companies. Uh, India, it's a little bit reduced. Um, yes. So Indians want to move with speed. And they'll go for the cheapest option. Yes. That's, that's how And you one of the main issue I have with Indian customer is that they think they can do everything on their own. Hmm. They'd never want to buy services. So they say, I'll just buy the software. I will do myself. But you know, when you change your accounting, you change your inventory management, you change a purchase, sale, your website, you do a new website. It's even though our software is super simple, it's better if we help them with service, but most Indian companies try to do that on their own first. And then they call only if they have issues. 
where in the US they will say, I need someone that does everything for us. I will do nothing and just buy a lot of service to be sure that we do the job for them. One layer deep, psychologically speaking, why do you think that difference is there between America and India? Um, I think it a lot comes down to price. If they don't want to services because they don't want to buy service, I believe. Um, I'm always surprised when you go to a shop in India, you want to buy, I don't know, Kit Kat, chocolate <laughs> bar. There is always the 10 rupees Kit Kat, the 20 rupees Kit Kat, the 35 rupees Kit Kat. Um, it's all about price. And I understand, I mean, it's not the same level of quality of life. Americans have so much money and credit, they can buy everything on credit. Um, here it's more rational, I would say. People are more practical about going about. They are more um, savvy. Hmm, they focus for on sure. saving money more. Yes. And something that changed a lot is uh, sometimes in India, you throw humans at the problem, you know, mm-hmm. uh, where in the other countries, you try to automate to have less employee, less cost, less. In India, the, some uh, workers are so cheap that sometimes you just put more workers to solve the issue. One of the examples I had is uh, our accounting software. Um, it's, uh, you know, accountant, they receive their job in the morning, they get a pile of bills and they have to record the data in the, in the system. It's a bit shitty. You record data every day. <laughs> it's not a very interesting. No is artificial intelligence. All this is processed automatically. You don't need to record anymore. You just put that in the scanner and 90% is recorded automatically for you. Only 2% you have to check. Um, and so we do that in Europe, in US, massive success. Everyone loved it because they have less time to record, more time to validate. Uh, ac- the accountant can do tax optimization, interesting things rather than recording data. Mm. And then I came to India and showed that to accountant. And accountant were doing the math. Our system at the time were costing six rupees per bill, which for me was nothing. And then they do the math. Oh, one accountant cost me this, and then they do how many? It cost me three three rupees to record manually in the system. Uh, why would you would I use your artificial intelligence that costs eight rupees? So they prefer to to pay people to record manually, and that's one of the examples where we had to change. I had to say, okay, no, this is, this is free. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence or your vendor builds to record automatically. We had to put it free in India, otherwise they will just put small hands doing it. I'll give you like the Indian startup entrepreneurship perspective. Again, it's about cost saving because I think Indians have learned now that successful startups are built out of being profitable and not just raising money. Yeah. So everyone's trying to bootstrap and we know that our advantage is that there's a big population. So you can get work done for cheap through human beings. I think yeah. that's the big uh, yeah. mentality difference. Yeah. Right? You have the, this capacity of having affordable jobs. Yeah. Yeah. But um, what, mind- what Americans are understanding and Indians don't is that sometimes having the right tool, like a beautiful website instead of a shitty website, mm. or a quotation that looks nice, uh, improve your conversion rate on sales. These are the things that sometimes India are too sensitive to the cost yeah. and miss uh, the leverage to sales. Things that they can do that would improve their sales. Yeah, I, I agree with this. Like, there's too much of a focus on saving money. Yes. And not focus on like creating a beautiful front uh, or an efficient service service support or uh, efficient operation hmm it's probably also because like just generally so i feel we've got independence like 75 years ago and only in the last four five years am i really seeing a drastic change in india because the internet reached the rest of india mm-hmm. so people are getting education about how the world works mm-hmm. you know even with this podcast i'm sure we're going to have listeners who don't speak english but understand english and they're just tuning in to see what a European is saying about the country so that they can learn. Mm. So India's like learning all these things, but the focus is totally about saving money. Yeah, which in, in some point is good. That's the reason why they can afford development service to the US and the Europe. But in some point, they have so much to win to understand how to make an efficient business uh, with quality support, quality tools, good website. If, if Indian companies understand that, then they can skyrocket. Uh, because it doesn't cost too much today. Yeah. Also, if Indian companies follow what you're saying in terms of efficient service, good looks, in terms of the UI, UX, we'll be able to sell abroad. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what a lot of Indian organizations are not being able to do. Yes. Like in terms of our websites don't look great. The UI, UX quality in India as of now is not 
at the world standard no no it's not yeah but in europe when you see swedish companies when you see you know british companies the the look the quality and feel is very very different yes i think that's the big weakness we have in india i see it changing a little bit like we have ui ux designer influencers now teach ui ux design but that's one person yeah and that's why i think odoo has a role to play in india because that's what we are bringing to the indian companies is tools all of these getting a beautiful website automating your accounting uh, efficient crm or help desk tool it's all about tools when you have good tools you can perform better uh, in a more efficient way and that's exactly what we do so that's why i relocated myself to india is to say okay there is a big gap there will be a big need because indians are growing fast and uh, understanding very quickly so a lot of these companies who are doing everything on spreadsheet today they will need better tools uh, tomorrow and that's why we are focusing on this market today what have you learned in the last 9 months have you been able to educate people uh, a lot uh, you know when i arrived we were selling uh, 10 new clients per month one year ago and now the rhythm is we are acquiring uh, 350 new clients per month and it's growing like that huh? so i'm waiting 6 months and we'll be at 1000 new clients per month and this is just word of mouth it's just word of mouth in my eyes i think you're doing something very brave because it's not easy to expand a software business in india for a foreign brand no uh, you're like, wrong it's easy it's easy uh, really yes think I'll, i'll tell you where i'm coming from all my foreigner friends who are trying to set up business in india they have trouble uh in understanding the indian market oh that's for sure you have to understand them that's why you need to come here uh, i it would have never worked if i wouldn't have relocated myself here like you learned you it need by to staying. learn but indians are very open compared that to china or very open it's a democracy it's uh, very international a lot of people are speaking english i mean all the check all the checkbox are green in india what what are the checkboxes for you but that english speaking country uh very open to international business a uh, big need of growth expansion gdp growing it, and so on these three alone uh, think 10 years ago everyone was talking about brics you know the brazil russia india china the, the big countries where you need to invest brazil inflation are killing everything russia is in war uh and rupees have been divided by three uh, because of the war china impossible for foreigners because everything's closed and even if you succeed the government will catch your company and acquire it the only missing country is in the brick today is india so if you have to choose one country to invest it is india and if i have to choose a second one i would pick india too really yes there is no other country with that level of opportunities wow okay very good perspective yeah uh it's honestly something that indians love hearing was indians love hearing foreigners talk about india but uh i don't know how much the world knows about what you're saying because when i go abroad and i talk to people about expanding the businesses in india they always say something like yeah but we're not able to understand the indian mind completely now they, they most of the world don't understand because um so our company we do 400 millions turnover uh 550 this year um india we were doing 5 millions so when i said i will go to india because i bet on this country people were say well, we do 5 millions on this country but uh, and we do 500 in the group so why would would we focus but it's because people don't see the opportunity if you do it right you can i mean the biggest companies in the world like tata 700,000 employees it's crazy huh? uh the largest in in belgium is probably us with 2000 3000 employees 4000 but only the two, one 1500 in belgium you're the largest belgian software company uh software for sure and one of the largest uh companies. every sector you're one of the largest companies in belgium yeah. and the founder of that company has moved probably to probably uh, one of the most valued too well at least in the top 10 most valued you're a multi billionaire in european dollars. founder who's moved to gandhinagar yes that's why the my friend calls me the slum dog billionaires <laughs> how does it feel being a billionaire Uh, it's not like people think uh you know in my bank account i'm not rich in my bank account it's i don't have a lot of money in my pocket I, uh because uh everything i own is just shares of a company um it's just the value of a do that, that is big um and uh, because i'm the main shareholder um but it's like like i have money to spend i'm not buying big cars i'm not buying big houses 
I, I live in very small house in, in Gandhinagar, actually. Um, so it's not like people think. Um, my richness is to have a great company, which is Odoo. And I don't plan to sell my shares, so it's not like I will convert that into cash. I will always keep it that way. Hmm. You just want to grow business for the sake of business. I think, yeah, because there is nothing less interesting. Yeah, there is no, nothing more interesting than that. I mean, I could go to the beach or I could go to holiday. That's <laughs> boring. Uh, I, I, in the other hand, I can uh, change people's work at li the life of people at work. I uh, could have an impact of millions of people uh, doing great software where they reward us every day, telling us our oh, software is good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, that is great. It's much better than what I could afford with money. Um, if your son, you have a son? Yes. If your son comes up to you and says, hey, billionaire dad, I want a Ferrari. What are you going to tell him? Uh, no, I would say get the money to buy it yourself. Are you in your will? Are you going to give all your money to your kids? Uh, I will give them a company. Not you'll, money. You'll give them the company. Yes. And then it's for them to do. If I die. <laughs> when I die. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I, I find you. I'm saying this as a compliment. Yeah. Okay. But you're very eccentric. You're like a, a crazy guy. <laughs> like, I'm not sure. But yeah. No, I mean, coder to founder to pivoting to almost going bankrupt. Yeah. And then you're a multi-billionaire now and you choose to live in Gandhinagar. Ah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's all about the experience. I mean, living in a country you don't know, learning from a new culture, new people is way more interesting than driving a new car. Go on. Yeah, it's uh, for me, it's all about the experience. And there is also a lot, something I'm convinced uh, about is, you know, uh, what makes happiness. People think uh, money makes happiness, but I think it's not what you have that makes happiness. It's how you evolve. So if you are here, you get that, you are super happy. Or if you are here, you get that, you are super happy. But you, when you are there, what do you do to be very happy? You cannot buy more cars, more oh, It doesn't work. So it's good also sometimes to level, uh, to, uh, to um, slow down or decrease your quality of life so that you get used, you don't get used to big richness and so on. And you get very happy. You know, when I come back to Belgium and I eat meat, super happy. <laughs> 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 because I, I, I eat veg, veg for months or... Uh, like yeah. as in your expectations from life are very simple. Yeah. And if your expectation is low, it's the best way to be happy in life. Damn. How do you look at money? What is money for you? It's a mean. For me, it's a, money is a mean to develop a bigger business. Like it's a means to... To a goal. And for me, the goal is to develop a bigger business. And so that we can do software that helps more and more companies. Um, so money is very important. I need to... Uh, that's why uh, we focus on selling and uh, things like that. But you know. Not as a goal in itself, but as a mean to uh, develop the software we want to develop. Okay. Uh, I kind and of it, it cannot be the, the other way, because if your goal is to make money, you won't be happy or you won't succeed your goal. Mm. But if your goal is to make a great product, uh, then if your product becomes great, then money will follow. Damn. <laughs> Has Gujarat taught you anything about money specifically? Because Gujarat are... They told me about, yes, negotiation. <laughs> I was very bad at negotiating. I thought I was good. And then I came to India. And then, uh, <laughs> these guys are so crazy in negotiation that uh, I, I learned from them. What did you learn? Uh, to be more pushy. You need to be more pushy. Yes. Indians are very pushy. When they negotiate, negotiate very, very hard. Even in weddings, they played, you know, this negotiation game uh, during weddings. Um, you, you get the shoe of the bribe and you have to buy it back <laughs> <laughs> uh, everywhere they negotiate. <laughs> but, and specifically Gujarat, I think is a negotiation center. Of uh, maybe, India. maybe Gujarat, maybe it's Gujarat. Yes. They have the best business skills, them and Marwadis. The, mm -hmm. These are the two communities, which are known as the business communities uh, in India. Uh, no, they are very good at negotiation and it's good. It's useful for the, for all our activities actually. S Suppose you go back to Europe or America, you'll be using these Gujarati negotiation skills there. Yeah, I will train the team there. But you'll be... I mean, it's already done because, you know, when you have a group of different countries, they all work together. So initially, I, I asked a Belgian team to train Indians. Um, for instance, the influencer marketing team, the, the Belgian team trains the Indians. How we proceed... Uh, and then they do call together and then they notice that the Indian person is negotiating way better than them. <laughs> so mm. they learn from the call. Mm. Um, um, and working together, we all learn from the strengths of the other, which is, which is good. Yeah, which is why in club football, 
every player has different nationalities everyone yeah. brings their own strengths to the table yeah. do you, do you look at international business expansion in the same way that indians have a role to play in international businesses but they should be played to their strengths yes um you know we have a big company in dubai 600 people something um the director come from gujarat too <laughs> uh, he went there and um, so the way we we do or to do is that we have a rule Every employee can switch from one company to another country uh, if he has two years experience. He just have to ask and we say, okay, and he can work in any country of the group. That way we push people to travel and discover and learn from that experience. And which countries are you spread in? Uh, we are in uh, S- uh, San Francisco, Buffalo, United States, Dubai, Mexico, Spain, Italy, Germany, Australia, Belgium, of course, um, Hong Kong. Um, I probably missed a few, but how are you so humble after building all this? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Do you look at yourself as humble? Uh, I don't look at the past. I don't care too much about what we built. What I do focus on is what we should build. Um, if you look at to do day, even though it's exploding, we are the best management software you can get on the market, growing like crazy. It's still. 1% of the market, 0.1% of the market. Market is so big. Every company in the world, small to large, uh, every industries, we are still 0.1% of the market. So when I look at, when I, when I look at it, I am not saying, yeah, we succeeded. I'm looking at it like we do 0.1% of the market. Oh, we got to that, from that to 5%. And so I'm focusing more on the future, what we should do and continue to do in order to keep this growth rather than what we have succeeded. Man, uh, I'm really enjoying talking to you, genuinely. <laughs> like, I'm glad I get to do this for a living. I was telling you, I have a great job, you know. Meeting but, people. <laughs> yeah, but how often do you meet a European billionaire who's staying in India? You know, and there's so many questions I just want to ask you for myself about your life, <laughs> about business lessons, about what we can do better. Because I truly believe that Indians who can speak good English mm-hmm. should be thinking about selling their stuff abroad. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot that our country can sell abroad, but in order to sell abroad, we need to understand the foreigner mind much more. How do you look at India? How have you sold things here? Mm-hmm. This is a very important business conversation. So this is a conversation I would have with you anyway. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate the time you're giving because I am 100% sure you're a very busy guy. But you know, you're coming to Mumbai for a day, speaking to me. Mm-hmm. I, I don't even feel like I'm talking to like a 44 year old guy. I feel like I'm talking to a guy who's just my age and you're talking like a brother. <laughs> so yeah. no, thank good you. For, yeah, it's good. To thank know. you for being so open firstly. Yeah. Uh, what's been the most fun thing you've done in India? I think building a business is fun. <laughs> yeah, really. It's lots of problem solving challenges. It's uh, um, setting up things. It's creative. It's uh, so... The best I did is to, to, to scale, hyperscale the company. In India? Yes. Uh, the scaling has been the most fun thing. Yes. So, okay, let me reframe the same question. When you first got here, in the first week and in the first month, what were your set of learning? So what did you learn in your first week about this country? What did you learn in your first month? So the first week when you, so, uh, when you want to uh, transform a company, first week you just learn. You work with people. You learn who they are, who are the best, uh, who we can leverage to make the company scales, what are the weakness, what are the strengths, uh, so that you can rely on. So I would say the first weeks, I didn't do a lot of things. I just worked with people, uh, helped them on small details, but more it was more a process of learning for me. You understood your teammates. Yes. Correct to say? And you were trying to absorb what situation you're yes, in. Yes, you help them when you know things, but it's better to more listen than talking. And after that, then I can replicate all the good uh, practice we had to do. And, uh, and some of them I had to adapt because it didn't work in the Indian market. Others, I just replicated what I used to do in other companies and it worked here. Like what? Can you break that down? Both the ones that um, didn't work and the ones... For instance, one of our marketing strategy had to do is to do uh, what we call roadshows. It's events in different cities. And uh, when I arrived here, Rocho had like 40 attendees, which is nothing. Mm. Uh, when we do roadshows in Africa, we have thousands of people. In Europe, we have thousands of people. And we had 40 on such a big country, on large cities. It didn't work. <laughs> so I did the usual marketing tactics, uh, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, uh, mass mailing, and so on. And then I went to 600 attendees. 
I was like, mm, start to be good. Okay. And I But came to the management, very proud of me. Were they coming to meet you? No, no, it's uh, not For me. It's um, or uh, salespeople who do demonstration of the product. The Yodu community work together, presentation gotcha. of customers and things like that. So you use digital to create a community online? Yeah, we already have a big community here to do. We leverage this community and try to bring more people. And we do uh, events that are on, on site in big cities, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Ahmedabad, uh, Pune. But it was a community grip through social media. Yes. LinkedIn. Because we had, I had too, many, too few people when we started. I had to do advertising to bring more attendees to our events. This is performance advertising you did? Yes. On Facebook? Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, That and so on. use our product? Yes. That's it. Okay. Uh, the ones we use or potentially will use the product. So I did that. I scaled that and it went well. Uh, we went to 600 registered attendees. I thought it was very good. So I was like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> uh, and then only 120 people show off. Uh, show, went, to, went to the event, actually came. So the no-show was huge, like 80% no-show. Like 600 people signed up for the event, but only... 120 came. Hmm. And, and so that's where I noticed that in India it's different. Uh, you have to do way more. Um, and that's something I learned when I was looking for an apartment or house for me, is that you, you have booking with people to, to visit houses, and 50% of the time they just don't come. They don't, they, you arrive, nobody's there. You have to call one hour before to say, I'm coming, I'm here and then they come. And so uh, I worked on how can we improve so that more than 20% of the attendees come. And so we started with WhatsApp and that worked very well. Uh, we did reminder one hour before the event, one day before the event, SMS marketing, and that works very well. And that's the kind of things where I learned in India because nobody used, I, I was not using WhatsApp in Belgium, um, but here everybody uh, use it. And so now that you automated reminder, we had way more people uh, to roadshows. shows. And uh, I learned that from India. We put that in the product. So now Odoo has WhatsApp in all the applications in standard. For the point of sale, when you have tickets, you receive the tickets on WhatsApp. Bill, you receive your bill or invoice on WhatsApp. Events, you have your notification, registration notification on WhatsApp, everything. And then it helped all over the countries too. Because we deployed that in uh, Latin America, worked very well too. We deployed it in Africa, they love WhatsApp too. It worked very well because I learned it from India. You know the word empathy? Empathy is like understanding someone else's emotions. Yes. I feel that in a business person's career, somewhere after you gain some success, there'll be a point where you begin to lose a little empathy because business makes you very dry and mathematical. Yeah. And you have to just like self-correct. I've seen this with a lot of uh business folks i've had on the show as well mm. a lot of them uh say that the biggest mistakes were a point where they overvalued what they were trying to sell or they were trying to chase money too hard and even here yeah. i mean three layers deep we boiled it down to the same yeah, it's usually a mistake i don't do but that time i did it yeah you're, you're right okay uh how do you look back at your 20s because you're 44 you have a nice family life mm -hmm. you have a good like material life you know your company is doing well your europe's one of Europe's youngest billionaires. Mm. How do you look back at your 20s? Uh, I feel like it's the same for me. Like you when I was 20, my focus when I want to build the best software. Today, my focus is I want to build the best software. Mm. And uh, things changed, of course. Uh, but the strategy, the long-term vision, what I like to do, what I do remains. I still spend the majority of my time uh, making sure that Odoo is much better than the competitor, improving the software. It's still the same. I'm still doing what I like. It's even better now <laughs> because in the, when you are small, like 50 people, you have to deal more with HR stuff. When you are big, you can delegate the HR stuff and focus on really what matters. So it's a bit better for, even for me now. Which is the product. Yes. The product, the product or uh, the company. Um, the culture, the improving. So I focus on the, if we transition, we have to change the department or big, that's the reason why I came to India, a big transition for the company. So I focus about things that bring value to the company. Why did you choose Gujarat in India? I didn't choose Gujarat. So when you create, um, we, we launched a lot of companies. We did Odoo in Mexico, uh, Spain, Italy, Buffalo, and so on and so on. Um, the key to succeed, a new to succeed a new company is not the location. The key is the director. This is the most important thing. You can have a good director in a bad location, it will work. You can have a good location, average director, it's going to be painful. And so the way we work, it's always about people. 
the way we work when we want to open a new company is never to say we want to go there or there. It's more about who is the best, best guy we have in the company that we can leverage to create a company with. So you had a bunch of employees in Europe and America and you pick out like one of the best. So leaders. the way it worked is I was working with a French company uh, who had this subsidiary in uh, India. And I was working with them and then I worked with Mantavia, our director uh, at the time there, and it's still the director today. And I noticed that this guy is very good. And so I wanted to do something with him and say, okay, let's create a company. So we discussed with this French company, I acquired 50% of the shares and then the totality because we split and we, I get the totality. Uh, but it was not about Gujarat. It was about Mantavia. If that was these guys that uh, I would say, okay, he's good enough, we can build something with him. And it's always the same. You know, we have a company in Buffalo. Nobody goes to Buffalo. Mm -hmm. New York. It's in the state of New York, but it's not New York. It's uh, way above. Uh, nobody goes there. You go to Silicon Valley, San Francisco, New York, Boston, but not in Buffalo. It's like a desert city, old industrial city. Uh, where we get there? Because of the director. Nick, our director there, is super good. We wanted to do something with him because he went from he came from Buffalo. We okay, let's go to Buffalo. And it turns out it was a very good decision. The, it's amazing to have an, an office there, but it was all all about the people, not about the location. So, your key to expanding business, especially internationally, is actually great leadership. You pick out the best yes, team captains because execution is stronger than strategy. Execution is about having the right guy that can make it happen. Hmm. Uh, is stronger than having better market or strategy. Strategy is important, but execution is much more important. Because I think uh, strategy is built out of feedback. Yeah, and like, strategy can evolve. If you have someone who is capable of making things happen, transforming companies, he will evolve with the strategy. Hmm. So your director chose Gujarat? So I chose a director. He lived in Gujarat. And because he lived there, we created the company there. And actually, he was a student, huh? so it was not a directly student. We recruited a few people, and he started in his student room. And now he's managing six hundred fifty people. How old is this guy? Uh, I think he's four less than me. Forty. He's forty years old. Yes. Okay. Working with me since uh, sixteen years. And you met him where in Europe? Uh, no, I met him in. I came to India. I met him online. Because I worked with this French partner and we initially worked on some tasks together online. And then I came to meet him in India. And you prioritized his comfort? Uh, yes. But I, I didn't know about anything. Huh? I didn't know about the other cities. Uh, all I knew is that, okay, I have a good guy there. Let's use him. Damn. Do you know what analysis paralysis is? No. Analysis paralysis means you analyze so much that you don't end up doing anything. <laughs> Like, you know, you're just thinking about the problem, but you're not actually solving it. Yes. This is the polar opposite. You're someone who believes in like doing things first and then figuring. Yes, yes. there is another way uh, to, uh, there is a good book from an Indian actually. Uh, how is it called? It's, um, oh, I forget the name, sorry. What's it, business? No, it's rational thinking vers uh, versus, uh, I forget, but I can explain the concept. Um, the, you have two types of managers. Some manager will define the goal. Let's say you want to create a restaurant. I will do a rest. You will, will do market analysis. I will do a restaurant in this area, maybe a Chinese restaurant, uh, and I will design the menu and it's going to be at that price. And then it will cost that much money. So I'll find fund and then I will recruit people and then, 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 then. So some people work that way. They start with defining a goal and then from the goal, they decide if it's what we call traditional manager, MBA style manager. I don't work that way at all. I work the opposite. I don't look at where I go because that changes. I, I cannot predict the future. I look at what I have. I look at my environment. Maybe I have a good deal to have a restaurant location there. I will jump there. And then I will try to leverage everything I have. Maybe I know a chef which is super good. He's not Chinese, but he's... Uh, Indian, so I will do an Indian restaurant. And the way I work is more on that, is to optimize my path to optimize to uh, the ultimate goal. I, but I don't define the goal because I don't think it's possible. For instance, I never do budget in over two years. I know it's not possible. What I do is to optimize how we spend money to be sure it's the most efficient possible. So I start from what I have, I optimize, and I, I ensure we, we get the best outcome out of it. But I cannot predict. I don't start for the prediction because it, create constraint that you probably don't want. Puts pressure. Yeah. 
rather just focus on the process and do it's it it's more about top down rather versus uh, bottom up versus top down you believe in bottom up much more yes gotcha uh you have to mix and huh? you still need a vision but uh yes i don't i don't think like market analysis business plan uh budget planning i don't think these kind of things are useful in india specifically is your main market in mumbai delhi bangalore uh, it's widely spread all over uh, yeah even in the world uh, our biggest market is the us but we only do 15% of revenues in the us so it's very much spread on a lot of different countries let's first speak about india i want to know about your world mm-hmm. game also but in india um so your team is sitting out of gandhinagar yes uh and they're selling across india yes right yes uh so that has been smooth for you or do you think that if you moved to mumbai or delhi or bangalore you'd get better results for this country um the location is not that so what matters on the location for me we most of the thing when we sell to small and mid sized company it's over the phone or video conference right so you don't need to be physically present uh so what matters um to have good engineers you have good engineers and very good engineers going you have also uh, elsewhere but there you have very good engineers the good thing is in gandhinagar or andabad that you don't have google apple ibm uh, there so you can actually get the good engineers which is more difficult if you go to the indian silicon valley like mumbai bangalore and delhi so for that it's very good and you need good retention because in order to build for the long term you need people to stay long time in the company which is a challenge sometimes in india um how do you get good retention good salaries you have to pay 20 30% above the the market because it's very important for indians and two uh, less competition on the market uh and three good working environment good culture and so on and i believe that for this uh gujarat is very good you have less pressure of competitors on the it market you still have a strong universities uh for engineers um and salaries are a bit lower than what you could get in uh, mumbai or delhi which allows you to easily pay above market yeah and here i think there's also a massive problem we face is rent for yes, people who work the, with then us. for the employees cost of living of course yeah. is lower therefore salaries are way higher mm. also yeah but it's crazy i never in my wildest dreams thought that someone like you would be staying in gandhinagar and building out your business no and you know the biggest mistakes i did uh, i created a company in san francisco big mistake because it's a tier 1 city and you are next to google apple microsoft oh can, oh, can you recruit the best engineers <laughs> next to these guys uh, and the cost of living is so high that uh, a big mistake i did in after in buffalo super good mm. and so now we have a rule at to do is we never go to tier 1 cities Damn. we always go to tier 2 cities because that's where we can uh, have a better retention of the employees <sighs> no one's ever said that on this show um they should and you know i i get some uh, i remember when i so i we have a few investor vcs uh, in the board and so they ma- they did a big market analysis for us what were the what are the best cities to put the second office in the in the US and they came with a list of 50 and buffalo was not even in the list <laughs> and i said no no we will go to buffalo Damn. and why because we have a director not because of buffalo at the time i didn't care about buffalo all i cared was it it could not be one a tier 1 city it has to be a tier 2 and the director decided the city you're reteaching me a lot of the business things that i thought i knew <laughs> you know i had like a way i looked at business yeah but, but this what and what you're saying makes sense yeah yeah if you create a company in san francisco you will suffer super high salaries high rent i uh, not have av- engineers not available it's better to go to sl- smaller cities i'm asking you this because you're also a software developer yourself mm-hmm. like you've actually coded in your life mm-hmm. how good is the quality of coders in san francisco versus the rest of the world like are they significantly better no i think uh, i'm pretty sure belgium is even better yeah or at least it's comparable india a bit lower bit lower the average you could get very good guys in india they are very good engineers developers but if you take average versus average india is a bit lower average versus average india is a bit lower than belgium but you've seen a few Europe. stars in india the, the but uh, the good thing is when you are in gujarat that you can pick the top 1% or the 0.1% and these guys are very good 
these guys are comparable to san francisco coders yeah i do, i so we we don't do research and development in san francisco so we don't do development we only do development for customer service so the only two research and development center we have is belgium and india okay your best indian coders how do they compare to your best belgian coders a bit lower bit lower yes like the belgian guys like a little bit more yes why do you think that is i think it's all about education the quality of the universities do you see it changing in india um yes for sure uh, f- what surprised me is that the school for my kids but it's 12, 10 to 12 years it's as i said better than what we get in belgium so at least there it is, there are some schools that are much better uh, so it's improving a lot yeah like i have some cousins who live in delhi they're a lot younger than me they probably 16 years old now 17 years old now mm. i remember when they were in the 5th and 6th grade they were in a good school so they were learning product design in the 5th grade mm-hmm. i learned product design when i was 25 years old yeah. myself from youtube it, i didn't have it as a subject and when you talk to them they way smarter than like what we were at that yeah, age that's good yeah i think it's the new generation uh, will bring a lot to the indian market yeah but you know this is like the top 1% in terms of income in india yeah but th- these are the ones that matter the turn one person will drive everything to the top yeah you think so uh, yes um, the best way or uh, on poor country the best way for poor countries inequalities are very good to make poor countries goes out of being poor um because the the top is driving the bottom to the top mm. so um, yeah so the guys at the top actually need to then stay back in india and then lift the rest of the country uh, you need entrepreneur you need successful companies in order uh, to generate business and work for everyone we've had a lot of political content on the show lately and the political commentators said that the next time you have entrepreneurs on the show ask them about the ease of doing business in india do you find it easy to do business in india it's very easy very easy it's the market is the country is very open I brought this up because the political commentator said that that's the representation of the government then. And Indians usually pick a side. Indians are either pro Modi or anti Modi. Okay. You're a complete neutral. Like you're from Belgium. Yeah. And you still find it easy to do business in our country? It's it's easier than in the US. Um Americans are very very picky. If your product is not perfect, beautiful, pixel perfect, Americans won't buy it. No. In India, even if your product is not perfect, they will make a way, figure a way to to use it. No, I'm ease of doing business means as a business owner, you know all the all the back end stuff. I think it's easy. You didn't find any you, difficulty. You have to adapt yourself to to the people, but I don't think it's too difficult. Has there been a country where you found it very difficult as a business yeah, owner? Yeah, in China we failed. I tried. I invested 1 million dollar in China. We created a joint venture with a large company. We failed. Completely failed. Uh here it's super easy. When was this China phase? um we tried this in china a few years ago like seven years ago okay we i need to expand that thought also but we'll first finish this mm-hmm. do you notice the modi government like do you follow what they are doing in the country yes you know from a geopolitical perspective in china at least the narrative we get in india is that it's a very dictatorship oriented culture and that government wants to control everything that chinese citizens see the way chinese citizens think and when i meet chinese people it's a little mixed some of them who have lived abroad are very indian in some ways they're very friendly mm-hmm. you know they they like india etc sometimes uh, abroad when i meet some chinese people i feel like they're a little bit in their own zone they're a little bit away they don't want to connect not with indians just with anyone they're a mm-hmm. little bit in their own world i don't know i don't have experience because i only went a few days in china so i don't have that experience that much experience We have a company in Hong Kong but Hong Kong is so much different than China that it's difficult to for now. Yeah. It's probably going to so, become a part. We'll see. Uh but the company is still there in Hong Kong? Yes. Yeah. We have 250 people there. Do you visit Hong Kong? I went a few days. Yes. You like Hong Kong? Uh mixed feeling. Why? Uh, um it's different mindset. It's very expat guys. Mm. Uh Uh, it's a lot of mo- about money i'm not at all about money um in the discussions who, who owns what and so it's not my style you mean people show off people show off uh, uh your status is your, is your salary and uh, that kind of things which is some people like but I, it's not my style okay uh but you visited china as well yes you enjoyed it like being in the country 
Yeah, it's a, it's always good to visit a country. <laughs> What did you like about China? Uh, but I don't think I could say I visited because I have, I went a few days. It was only to walk with the company, so it's only the professional experience yes. you got. But uh, they are super good hosts. I mean, they make you feel like, and China is a little bit like India. They, for instance, they don't respect contract. Uh, but they respect the relationship you have. So the first thing they do is not to write a contract like we Europeans do, but it's to build a strong relationship uh, between the, the, the supplier and the customer. And usually they succeed because of the relationship between people rather than contract. And so I've, I've noticed that they were very good at hosting us, welcoming us, working together uh, for that purpose. They took you out for a drink? Yes, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you have a story? Uh, I'm a very good drinker, so I, they tried to beat me, but it was <laughs> the other way around. You know, the Germans are very good in beers, but no, how, I don't drink anymore. So how did they get when they were drunk? Uh, like everyone else. Fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jokes. Yes. But how did you communicate with them? Um, the, the people I was working were, with are, were talking, we were speaking English. Huh? So what did they say to you? Like, no, nothing special. Does work conversation come up when you're drunk? Yes, yes. Like you'll talk about the contract yes, even yes, over yes, a drink. Yes, And y'all can be very... Yeah, but maybe it's my fault, huh? Because I always speak about work. So maybe it's me. I don't know if it's the, what's them or me, but uh, yes. You speak about work even when you're drunk? I think about... Uh, I am not drunk anymore. I don't drink since a few years because I have a um, liver disease. I can... If I, if I drink, I can die. Um, you got fatty liver. I have no, even more cirrhosis. You have cirrhosis? Yes, because I drank too much. <laughs> and so I cannot drink anymore since a few years, which is okay. I, love, I, I like this. Um, yeah. But you drank a lot when you were younger? Yeah, that's why I have cirrhosis. <laughs> why did you drink when you were younger? Uh, it's, in Belgium, it's, it's part of the culture. Uh, students drink a lot. A lot of beers. How much did you drink? Too much. Like say if it was a Saturday night. I don't know. It was during the week. During the week? Yes. So I, I was, the, it was a student bar, which is owned by the student and they open every week. And during the weekend, you come back to your parents so you don't drink. But during the week, you drink the whole week. Every day? Every day. Yeah. How much every day? Uh, 30, 40 beers. <laughs> <laughs> Way too much. To the point where you get a cirrhosis. Oh, man. How does cirrhosis feel? Uh, it doesn't feel anything. So the liver is the only organ in the body um, that is where uh, it can regenerate, regenerate itself, yeah. except when you get to the level of cirrhosis. Um, and also it's uh, insensitive. So you don't feel anything. If it has issue in the liver, you will never feel anything. If you discover it, it's by luck. And I was very fortunate to had other issues. They made some scans. They discovered that uh, earlier in the process of the series. So I can live with that without issue for a long time, but I cannot drink at all. How did you feel when you found out? Uh, I thought I would die. <laughs> so because the process after it's months of examination and they told me exactly. So uh, when you look at theories in the web, you are like, it's horrible. <laughs> like you have 10 years to leave or that kind of things. But uh, they explained me at the end that I was of the very beginning. So I will just live like that my whole life without issue. But I cannot uh, transgress. Other than China, which place have you found challenging to expand into? Um, We, I don't have a good answer because we pretty much succeeded every country we opened. The only time where we failed, it was not about the country, it was about the person uh, because we picked the wrong uh, manager. So one thing I do have to do is that um, we never recruit manager, uh, director or manager. We never recruit that. The only way to become a team leader at to do is to be the best of a team. Uh, and so we make them grow. And one time it was to open in New York. I recruited an external manager, director. He has a good experience very on the resume. He was perfect. He built two startups that grew very big. Uh, he's Belgian from New York, so he could understand us, but he, he developed business in New York. So he was, I'm sure the guy is great, but it didn't work for us. It didn't work for us because it was not, he was good, but not, it was not what we are. He was not aligned with the way we manage our business. So it didn't work. Uh, all the other times, I always created a new country with a uh, non-employee who had probably no experience uh, of building companies and so on, but he was a good employee to do. Uh, and so we sent him somewhere and it always worked. 
Sometimes mm. it takes two years, sometimes four years. So the, the, the rhythm is a little bit different. Uh, but if you pick someone who is good at the job, even though he's not a director, even though he never created a company, uh, it's a good bet. I want to go a little bit deeper into this international expansion mm -hmm. thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now say I'm an Indian company and you just need to answer this from your own life's learnings. You need to talk from Odoo's learnings. Which was the first company outside of Belgium you expanded to? Uh, after Belgium, India. India was the first company. Yes, but not to sell in India. It's because I needed developers. Okay. Okay. Let me reframe this question. My point is when you're looking at a new region to expand into for your business. For, for sales. Yes. For sales. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want to expand in that country. Now I am sure at Odoo, your management and you, you have a set of protocols that when you go to that country, you'll have to follow these same cultural rules, mm -hmm. but then something will change in the way you operate there. Something might change. Yeah. So I want to know about that something. What is the constant stuff? What is the variable stuff? So all of the way we work is constant. The way we deliver the service, we have a methodology to implement a customer, to train him, to import his data, same. The way we sell, which is very product focused, we ask the customer what, what are the pain points and we create demonstration based on the pain, it's the same. Um, the only difference is local, is how you interact with people, how you party together, or you do your salary structure. That kind of things, but the rest, a lot, the majority of the what part of, of procedures to open a new country are the same for every country. Marketing, marketing is basically the same with some variants. So um, in our marketing, we have a strong. Um, we do events a lot, uh, like we do five hundred events, physical events, uh, five hundred per year, so two per day more or less. Um, um, we do that in every country. It works in many countries. Not with the same level of success. In India, Mexico, very successful. US, we have low attendance, but high quality people. So it's still the same approach. Uh, then you have online marketing, Google ads and so on. Same in every country. Um, we have education working because we are open source. A lot of teachers and universities your, use our product to teach, say, CRM, accounting, because it's free. Um, so we work a lot with schools and teachers and university that works in every country. So 90% of the marketing is, uh, the same, is the same, but there are some slight difference. Like I explained in order to develop the events, we, we do a LinkedIn ads, email ads, uh, Facebook ads, mass mailing and so on worked well for India. I had to introduce what, what's WhatsApp. Uh, in order to remind attendees that the event is tomorrow or in one hour. So there are slight difference, but it's 10% difference. Okay. Your structure effectively remains the same. Yes. Like your protocols, your yeah. strategy. And even for some of my like online marketing, it's even globalized. It's not per country. It's one person that does all the country for mm. all the ads. Mm. Okay. Uh, what is Africa like to, to work in and to expand into? Um, that is difficult. Uh, uh, in India, I feel like I could build an Indian company myself. It's very easy. In Africa, I wouldn't be able to because you have to be African. You have to be, uh, first, there is not one Africa Yeah. Uh, between the Maghreb and the South. And it's, it's so much different that uh, it's different. But could you take a region like West Africa, like Nigeria, Cameroon? That that region? We opened in Kenya. So do we have an office in Kenya? East. Um, yes. Um, and then you have to be, you have to be African. The way they negotiate, the way they decide, it's so much different from what we used to do. Uh, it's slower. Um, they have difficulties to decide. They don't decide. They do calls and call and call and never decide. Um, that's something yeah, where if you don't, you are not African, it's difficult to, to do. It's culturally a difficult place to enter. Uh, yes, for foreigners. Yes. For foreigners. Yeah. But then you, it's easy to enter if you look. So we, we opened the Kenyan office with an African guy who, who, who was in Belgium since a few years. So he, he came from our company. Then he, he went to, and it's working very well. I would assume that's true for any country. You know, you get a local guy to help you. That's the most important. That, of course, that helps. But in India, I have the feeling that he understand Indians. Mm. In Africa, I have the feeling that I, I don't. Um, it's so different. What have you understood about, say, Kenyans, for example? Um, I I don't have a lot of experience because I, I don't travel that much. I, uh, um, um, Kenyans is great. It's less, there is less um, 
corruption than in some other countries like uh, Congo, for instance, uh, which is extreme, um, which is good in a way, uh, very good. Um, there are a lot of good guys and businessmen, but what I felt is that things are slower. I never understand. I always have the feeling that the customer will sign tomorrow and he don't. He doesn't. And then I think, okay, we'll sign in one month. He doesn't. <laughs> and I, and it's, I don't know if it's me who don't understand if it's the process that is that way, but uh, it's, for me, it's difficult to catch. Why do you think it's slower? Um, no idea. I don't know. I don't, I don't have that much experience it's the way they are. So some questions are not answered yet. No, yeah, I don't have the questions to everything. But are you actively looking at African markets as a place to expand? Yeah, we are growing. The good news is uh, it's just that it's not my area. I have other people who, who do it. And I, because I'm not involved in sales in Africa, I let them do and I don't even watch out what they do. Could you name some countries that the, the team is looking into? No, I, I, it, that's a funny thing. If you ask me what are the future countries where we will open for Odoo, because we, last year we opened uh, five countries, I think, uh, I cannot answer. Because I am not targeting country. I'm searching for people. And the, other, the only way for me to open a country is to find the right guy. <laughs> and if I found it, he already created something. <laughs> so Damn. because we work that way, it, I would say in another way, the, uh, our international expansion is not about strategy. It's about opportunism. We have to find the opportunity to, of someone and wow. then we will create a company for him. Fair. Um, you've been almost bankrupt at some points in your life? Yeah, a few years, yes. How did that feel? Uh, um, on the moment, you just walk and walk and walk 16 hours a week. It's stress. And, uh, um, but I do believe that if Odoo is so good today, it's because of that period. It forces you to be efficient, to not spend money uh, stupidly. It's, it forces you to be very, very good in order to survive. Um, that uh, it creates at the end a company that is much better uh, than result, as opposed to a VC baked uh, company who get a lot of money. <laughs> they they will burn. They they didn't learn to to make it in an efficient yeah. way. That's what so many Indian startups are learning. Mm -hmm. That. Try having a bootstrap phase for as long as possible. It sets that bootstrapping culture in the company. Yeah. And, and that makes the company super efficient. And you know what? When So I've been close to bankruptcy for a few years to the point of I paid salaries sometimes a few days late um, because I just didn't have the money. Um, when things get better, when I started to have a lot of cash, it was difficult for me at that time because I, have, I had to find the motivation elsewhere. Before that, we, we nobody was thinking about what what is the purpose, what we should we do. We were just all trying to survive, 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 <laughs> serve client, get money, serve client. We were so much focused on surviving that we were not thinking. And then from one from one month to, or one year to another, at to do things started to be super good. We get a lot of cash, uh, millions. We and and then at that point we were like. Okay, now we have to find a new source of motivation. And it was a difficult moment for us to re-motivate the team because now we had to work for di something different than surviving. How did you motivate? Uh, then it's the purpose of the product, uh, serving our clients, uh, making great products. Uh, but it was a switch of mindset that we had to operate. This was that phase where you switched into product? Yes. Um, this phase took one or two years in order to be very cash flow positive, but it's that phase, yes. From a service company to a product company. Are you like a celebrity in Belgium? N not so much because I don't try to be. I try to, but I think some people knows me. Do you get fans coming up to you and saying that I respect what you've done? And Yes. How but that, you, that's every business model of large company have that, I think. How do you feel about that? It's always good. I mean, what do you think when people say that they like your show? It's always good. I think with YouTube, the thing is you're putting so much of your personality and mind out there that when people are coming up to you, they really know things about you. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different. You feel gratitude, but some I think I've reached a point in my life where I feel a little scared also when people uh, come It's too up. much, maybe. Yeah, I never thought I'd ever say that, but it's become that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm probably way less famous than you, even in Belgium. So uh, I don't get to that level yet. <laughs> Do your kids know how big you are, like in business? Yeah, but you know, I think most people don't understand. I mean, what is the value of the company today is uh, 4.5 billion. What is 4.5 billions of euro? Nobody, nobody knows. 
It's, it's just numbers. Uh, is it, it seems to be a lot, but what does it mean? It's difficult to relate to that kind of uh, numbers. The thought of selling your business has never crossed your head. No, no. I, uh, for sure, uh, I will never sell and I will never go public neither. I don't want to be a public company. Because you don't want that. You like how you're working right um, now. The reason is that um, uh, public companies tend to refocus on the short term. You know, you have to uh, publish earning calls with the, the sales number. And if the numbers are good, everyone is happy, they buy the shares. If numbers are bad, people are not happy and your employees are frustrated because they have shares and it's bad. So public companies have a tendency to focus on the short term to sales, sales of the month or the quarter and so on. I don't want that. The success of Odoo is always to build for the long term. And I don't want a single employee to look for the short term or the sales number of the quarter. One. The other thing is I'm so much focused on productivity and efficiency. Uh, when you get public, you need extra layers of reporting, transparency, uh, anything like that. Uh, th so the second reason, I don't want that. I want to be super efficient, decide right away instead of asking the board of directors. <laughs> um, and third, I like open and transparent communication. You know, I just said uh, the company was 4.5 billions of euro. If I was a public company, I could go to jail because I disclosed information uh, not bef before the earning calls. Like, I think if I, if I would have sent that to not, maybe not publicly ugly, but to some employees, I could go to jail. I don't want that. I want to be able to say whatever I want to inform yeah. my employees uh, and be transparent. Why do you think founders choose to go public? I think a lot of them don't understand. It's just a way to get cash. Um, but to understand the consequence of that, most of them don't catch it really. I don't think it's bad. I think as a source of cash, public is quite good. It's efficient, but it comes with some drawbacks. Like you have to uh, have extra layers of reporting complexity. You cannot disclose information and you, it will refocus the mindset to the short term. For some companies, it's good. Some companies need to focus on the short term, but it's not us. You know, I would go as far as saying, and I might be totally wrong while saying this, but I think there's a bit of a glamour factor also. Yeah, about going it's, public. A, it's a way of being recognized, but it's very short term. Like the moment you get public, everyone praise you, you get a lot of praise and then it goes back to reality after. Deal with the devil. Yeah. Like you'll get the fame, articles will be published. It's not the devil because it's not a big deal, but um, I'm extreme in everything I do. For me, if I lose... 1% of productivity, it's bad. I wouldn't want that for a do. Um, but, but it's not the devil. It's a What's the best career advice you've ever gotten in your life from someone? Just do it. <laughs> do and yeah, then... It's true because a lot of people are thinking, waiting for the good idea, um, deciding how we should do it. Sometimes it's just about move on. Get the job done first. Get then the job. Done. Maybe it works, maybe it won't work, but at least you move forward. And what's the worst advice you ever got? <laughs> advice? I don't know. Ah, um, open a... Um, no, I didn't get bad advice. I didn't follow advice. I don't have mentors and everything. I was working in the Odoo office, which is a farm. In a farm, quite alone, not meeting a lot of people. So I didn't get a lot of feedback. I'm going to give you a compliment again. <laughs> Same compliment. You're a crazy guy. <laughs> like, I've not met anyone like you on the show. No, I think a lot of people who bootstrap do that. You start from where you are and your small things. And no, I, I don't just mean your professional side. Even the guy you are, it's very different, man. Like, you know, I, I've okay. not seen this on the show and I've spoken <laughs> to like 600 people. Okay. Like I've not met someone who's done so much materially, but is still so humble. Mm -hmm. Like I still feel you're like a coder on the inside. You know, you're still... I am, uh, that's what I love. Huh? I am a coder. <laughs> but then that affects a lot of how you look at life. Like someone not someone else, many other people in your position who would have accomplished what you've accomplished mm. at this point, either would have chosen to sell it off and just relax or, you know, live a more. Yeah. But very will they be happy by doing that? I think different people have different life stories. Yeah. For me, there is nothing better that I can do than Odoo. It's the best I can do is to continue uh, improving the software for companies. It's, I feel like I don't see what I can do better than that. For Are the you society, I mean. Are you changing as a person as you age, not as a professional? As a human being, are you changing? Uh, I become better. No, I think no, I become slower also because of the age. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the vision and uh, what I wanted to do has always been the same. Uh, not at the very beginning, but after a few years, it, it has been there. How do you look at Silicon Valley and San Francisco generally? Is, uh, it, is it 
always going to be the center of tech in the world or yes they have a big advance um for not for the reason we think the main reason is the cash they have so many vcs or old ex google employees with plenty of millions to invest that basically any id can can live there and when when all the ideas can live some of them will be good and will make a good company do you uh, visit i have an office in san francisco yes like and, uh, before our office was in uh, uh in silicon valley and i lived three years there you lived three years uh, with the family yes can you talk to me more right now you're okay to talk to me yes right? Are you getting bored? No, that's you're, right. You're no. enjoying this. Do I feel bored? No, I, I just I want to stretch the conversation more. I want to get uh, to know more. Uh, let's let's go. You don't mind me asking all these questions, right? Like all this time we're taking. Go go for it. How are you feeling, by the way, in this? I I I I, I enjoy the, the the. It's good. We have a good conversation, and uh, it's fun because you're getting to think. Uh, yes, and for me, it's a different thing that what I used to do. So it's good. Okay. Um. Usually, people like yourself who come on the show, it's a thought exercise for them because the questions go like pretty intense. Mm-hmm. So, uh, especially entrepreneurs enjoy being on this show because they get to think much more. They uh, get yeah. to reflect. I don't know if you're in that zone. I don't need to think that much because I know very well my subject. So, it's things I'm used to talk about. So, what value is this conversation adding to you? Not, not, not Odu, just you. I'm surprised that you find that the discussion is so good for you. That you get a lot of value from it. For me, it's just normal. <laughs> uh, okay, but you are adding a lot of value. Like yeah, but that's what I'm surprised, and I'm, it's good to hear. I'm sure this one's going to get international viewers as well because you've not just spoken to the Indian audiences. Mm-hmm. You know, you've spoken to like like a lot of people want to expand the businesses in India. Yeah, uh, and they don't know how to. My solution to all of them when I've been asked this question abroad is. I think you need to tie up with an Indian partner. Like Indians have that team mentality also. Like mm. as we value yeah, it's very easy to find a co-founder in India. Uh so I mean that was my advice until today's podcast. Now I'll just send them this podcast and <laughs> look at this guy's story. Um <laughs> uh, maybe before we talk about America, one small question about India for the other foreigner founders, you know, founders from other countries who want to expand in this country. Mm-hmm. What's your advice to them? I think it just do it. Uh just uh book a flight ticket and c- come there a few weeks. Discuss with people, meet people and Indian are very entrepreneur mindset. So you will find good relationship that you can start uh, using and developing. Just a matter of what I did is that just go to India. Once you once you are there, things naturally uh, develop. And this whole angle about the population being really big it's a very legitimate reason to be here right like because the market size is that big and it's growing it's 8% growth of the gdp per year it's it's bigger huh? as in a population that's becoming richer a big population that's becoming richer mm-hmm. that's the business logic about being here right yeah. because at the end of the day business has to be a little ruthless and mathem- mathematical for me the, the the initial reason i went to india is the but um i was growing very fast in belgium um i was a small company like 20 employees when i went to india And when you grow fast, I was signing projects that was um, the revenue of the project was bigger than my turnover le- the preceding year. So bigger project, more than my turnover. But once you do that, you quickly need to recruit and set up the team to deliver the client. Mm. And the problem I faced in Belgium, um, if I needed, I had 20 developers. If I needed 20 more, it was like six to nine months to get them. But I just signed a client, so I needed it right away. So it's not not so much about the cost uh, of the developers. It was that I needed to uh, grow faster, and um, and so I had this before because at the end I wanted to recruit in Belgium, so I recruited Indians so that I have more times to catch up with Belgians. They were sitting in India. Uh, there were, with, yes. How did you come to know that India has this developer excess? Oh, everyone knows that. Everyone in the tech world uh, knows yes. that if it's the development center of the world, everyone knows that. Mm. Like you've heard of Infosys and TCS, of, yes, course. Yeah, of course. But had you heard of them before you came to India? Yes, of course. And how did you look at Infosys and TCS? Uh, I never worked with them, so I don't know. But what did you hear? But it's, I mean, TCS is four hundred thousand people. Can you imagine four hundred thousand developers? It's it's huge. I saw you reading a book about the Tata Group. Yeah, right I just now. started. I'm page twenty or something. Why are you reading that? I read a lot of books. But specifically, that Tata Group book you're reading because you're in India. Uh yes, but I think I would have read it before. No, I'm just because it's one of the book I'm reading now. Okay. Coming back to America. Mhm. Uh 3 years in Silicon Valley? 
you yes. lived there yes uh tell me everything man like what was your life like what were the conversations like did you actually get a view of the future did you have conversations about ai back then which year is this in? uh it was 2011 7 or 8 years ago so 2015 yes around, around that time yes uh was there talk about sam altman open ai all this even back no, then no it was not we, nobody was talking about ai at the time you enjoyed your time in america yes very much um i prefer india because the ex- because of the experience it's so much uh, san francisco is very much like belgium it looks like a european uh, city um so it's the closest you can get from a european city in america i would say um and india is so much different that i like because of the experience um in the us it's very different from here um the american have a totally different approach to purchasing a software in india i told you it starts with the price how much does it cost and then we look at the software if it's good or not how do you sell to an american an american you have to make him dream he wants something beautiful super clean he wants to dream it's emotional uh, and it has to be perfect uh, if an indian if it's not perfect he will find a way to use the product he will he will always succeed to use the product for in india it's just the price point as the sell uh, and if it's not perfect he knows he can use it he will it's okay there is a small bug there you will just turn mm. it around and use it differently and for them it's normal mm. in america it, it has to be very good super clean they are so used to have very mature software on their market that they are used to the perfect everything and so for me it took a, like 2 3 years to make the st- the product up to the standards of what an american expect damn um that's why yeah, i relocated there because i had to understand what exactly that but once you get there then it it, it gets easy because they are huge consumers they even buy the, everything on credit so they, they 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 can put a lot of money once they once they like the product and very quickly the way you learned about whatsapp marketing in india and then took it to the world mm-hmm. i'm sure going to america forced you to become a way better product and then you took that yes. way better product my, for the my challenge for the america was more the design the all design was not on par with the standard of americans uh, at the time no it's very good uh, better than the best uh, but at the time we were all design was our product was super powerful but design was not as clean as what an american expect so we had to fix that in order to start uh, the american business now it's our number one country in terms of revenue and this is because of the feedback loops in america you spoke to customers they said that yeah, you, you like... meet customers and you uh, you spend time trying to sell it's a good thing to try to sell for yourself go on the phone doing demos with customer check out they react and and then you adapt based on this feedback what else life in america um for me it was very much like in europe um, no it's it's good life I, I, for i have always i've always seen america like a big casino <laughs> like um if everything is good it's a big bet if if you're good in your life financially so if you have a good job good revenues everything's perfect it's dream dream of everything you have a good education but if one thing fail could be a nightmare if uh, you lose your job and you get sick you can quickly get homeless um if you don't have the revenue it's very very difficult um because especially in san francisco it's very hard if you when i was in san francisco a lot of people had two or three different jobs because one job was not enough to sustain the family which is hard it's very hard so when you not we are new, you you are not in the good classes it's very difficult for instance um something that always surprised me is that a lot of indians wants to go to america And what I've noticed in San Francisco is a lot of Indians who are top developers here. So they have very good salary for Indians, like uh, one point or two lakhs uh, in India, where you are a king when you have two lakhs salary in India. You can have a very good life. You have your own driver. You can you own cleaners, uh, a few people working for you. And then they go to America. They have a higher salary, but the salary is very low compared to the Cost housing market, the healthcare market, uh, education market. That actually their life is lower. Life uh, quality. Life quality is lower. That's something surprised me because I said you were the king there, and you go there, and you are <laughs> lower. It was my big battle when I was in engineering college to not give the GRE and go to America because society was looking down upon me for it in ah, India. Yeah, yeah. Because there's societal pressure that yeah. hey, you know what? 
you're probably just not ambitious mm. enough why do you want to live in this country but it was my argument that i would rather be a king here than go there and be one of the crowd yeah that's a good one and um so in america if you are good you've good job everything's great but if you get sick or if you uh lose your apartment or something it can quickly uh be very difficult because healthcare is super expensive uh education is super expensive um housing is very expensive so you need to but if you have that it's perfect dream mm, huh? dream life but if you don't you and it, and everything is related for instance your healthcare insurance is is related to your, to your work uh, contract so if you lose your work contract you lose your healthcare insurance mm. and if you get sick in the in, in between two job then you have to pay everything cash and it's basically impossible it could quickly be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars one kind of treatment if you have like a fracture of your arm then. yeah but my kid had um, he had a small uh, issue he had a um, he had temperature or something in europe when you have that you go to hospital and you pay maybe 20 euro or barely nothing because you have social security for a fever so we we did like good europeans we went to the hospital uh to check if the kids doesn't have uh, something he get an ice cream to know the standard so they gave him an ice cream they checked temperature of the thing a few medicines came back thing we went there 30 minutes huh? uh it costed us 2100 dollars <laughs> <laughs> it was 20 euro in europe <laughs> and so if you are rich no problem if you have an insurance we didn't have an insurance because we were europeans if you have an insurance that's okay but if it happens and that's a very small thing so imagine a real accident If it happens at a bad time, it could be a life-changing moment. So. Which actually happens to people. Uh, it happens to people. There are a lot of homeless. So you would be surprised about the crime and the homeless people in uh, San Francisco. So again, I don't know how true this is because I've not been to America since 2018. But we've had people who've come on the show and they've, they're saying that parts of America are growing a lot, like new cities. Austin is coming up mm. a lot. Denver is coming up a lot. But the old power centers, which is New York and San Francisco, are degrading. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's true. People are leaving San Francisco because of crime increasing, drugs increasing, homeless increasing, and the costs are super high. So they want to relocate, especially now with after the pandemic and uh, home working facilities, people prefer to relocate. But it's still a big business market. It's still Google, Microsoft, Apple. It's difficult to beat. How do Europeans generally look at America? Is it aspirational to go there? Yeah, I think we have a lot of things to learn. Like in product design, they are very good. Huh? Marketing, they are the pro of marketing. Yeah, best. Uh, service, they are the pro of service. Uh, like all they serve in restaurant or... Uh, they are very good in a lot of things. So uh, they are leader for a real reason. But they are also drawbacks. That's why it's a mixed field. What I like the most about Americans are the conversations. Best conversations I ever hear on American podcasts. Yes. And that says a lot. Yeah, they, they are very good storytellers. Yeah, yeah. They, but it's because when uh, when they get kids, they my kids when they were there, a very young age, like three years or four years old, they they are on the stage in front of the class and they have to present things every week. Mm. So they get very early on in their uh, teaching, they teach uh, kids to present things. They had something called uh, what was the name? I don't remember the name of the thing. But every week, the kid had to bring something from home. Go in front of every student and explain why it is show important. Show and tell. Show and tell. And every week. And th so they practice a lot uh, of that. Wow. Which is difficult when you do interviews. Huh? Because when I arrived in the US and I did interviews with America, everyone felt very smart for me. But most of them were bullshitting or mm, yes. <laughs> trying to, to, to show themselves better than what they are. Yeah. Um, it took me time to understand because when you listen to them, they are so good that it feels that they are really, really, really yeah. good. The reality is a bit different. Is they're very good at they selling, are, uh, selling, talking. Uh, so you have to look behind that. How do you look behind it? Uh, I think it's come with experience. Pattern recognition. Yeah. You need to pick up where people are bullshitting. Yeah. Uh, um, one of the things we do in recruitment is uh, we don't discuss too much uh, at to do. Uh, we actually do real exercise. So if you recruit a developer, making develop. Mm. If you uh, recruit an engineer, make him design architecture, understand business flow, to check, discuss about business flow, but don't talk about the resume. They will just make you feel like they're the best if you talk about the resume, you won't understand anything. Yeah, uh, I was telling some American friends of mine, these are not like Indian Americans, like American Americans, white guys, black guys. I was telling them that what I admire about your culture a lot 
is the whole sales culture you project yourself very well like yeah, i have yeah. learned that and honestly i'm using it in india yeah. i think there's a lot for indians to learn because we are the opposite of it yeah. like for us there's a lot of people who even if they're really good they're too shy to tell yeah do you see that about india yeah americans are much much better on that yeah. something india can learn from america of course that marketing product design they are very good on this what would you hire an american for marketing for sure especially if in content mm. uh, content writer storytelling uh, they are very good because of this show and tell and i think because of the television culture uh, also it's their nat- native language ah. for us english is our second language uh, mm. so i'm pretty sure for me at least i would have better answer in french uh, it helps when it's your native language what would you hire me for like now that you've got to know me um content Would you hire me? No, we we do a lot of videos. Uh, I don't think I can afford you. No, no, no. I mean, if I <laughs> if I didn't have the podcast, yeah, if, would you would you have hired me in India? Yeah, for for content, uh, it's uh, having good people in in terms of content doing it. Video is super important. We do, you know, we produce uh, to do something like six uh, hundred videos per year. So we have a huge team of content uh, video production. We have a podcast. Where do you put so it up? On YouTube mostly. for maintaining your community yes so it's mostly about education huh? we um have videos about how you can improve your sales how you can better do your accounting project manager how you can build a website with odoo so it's more about tutorials things like that um but it's very important for the community brother let's have a larger conversation here okay about mm-hmm. content and community because this is just a theoretical thing i've heard from a lot of people and i don't see that really happening in india right now other than with a few brands mm-hmm. so every brand says build your own community and then monetize it but i don't actually see too much of that happening mm-hmm. okay now parallelly going back to our conversation about how you scaled your business you said that one of your main marketing angles is that you have an active community uh, no yes and no um developing a community is not the role of marketing it helps marketing it but you we have a com- very strong community because of development because we worked we are open source so people can download and modify your software so even students in universities their teacher organize course on do and they go on github so they collaborate with us on github they make what we call pull requests so they propose feature they develop new feature on the software they propose to us we have a community because we collaborate together to build something you don't build a community just with marketing that's not community that's segment that's not- of a market's uh customer segment but it's not marketing marketing is something where we do something together and doing something uh, the community sorry is about doing something good together we have a very strong community we have two types of community partners and community who are not contract we don't even have a contract with us but uh, the community works because they are generating revenues from odoo um not because we market to them mm. um and so it depends on us we work together they develop new features for us because these communities are developers or partner or consultant who sell service on odoo and it's a big, big ecosystem one way one thing people misunderstood usually with odoo is that they think they okay it's a company of 4000 people the reality is not that odoo is an ecosystem with 200000 people whose full time job is to work on odoo selling developing or doing consulting only and that is a community when your people rely on your products because it's their life or their work um that becomes a community of fans and 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 the way you behave with them we collaborate with them so they we develop together on the same feature they can have the source code of our product improve things send back to us for feedback that's a community organization marketing okay. is not marketing is customer segment why what is the purpose of the content you're creating uh helping this community so it's about teaching educating it's not about marketing it's not about selling it's about making them become smarter and better so that actually then they can loop back into adding value because if they are smarter and better they will sell more to service and then i will get revenues but it's all about them it's not about us uh, it's something a lot of companies miss in marketing is that it's all about your people it's not about you mm. um content as a skill does it have a role to play in the future of worldwide businesses oh for sure is it's an important skill to be able more to- and more i mean look at the uh, influencer marketing it's exploding content uh, everywhere is exploding and there are some areas 
where it's very well behind. Huh? So um, like B2C is very mature. There are a lot of influencer marketing in B2C. B2B, there's barely nothing. Huh? The, it's very limited. So it's like we are the very early beginning of B2B marketing on content, whether it's video or podcast or whatever. It's very early days, I would say. It's more mature in B2C. So it means that we still have a few years of strong growth on this market because of that. Because of the B2B would only start to address this. If one has content related skills like editing, okay, if someone's a very good editor, very good mm. content creator, uh, you would hire that person. Yes. And uh, would other international businesses also hire these kind of people? Yeah, uh, you don't need a lot. Huh? So for instance, at to do over 4,000 people, I have seven who do, uh, because it's not a core business. You, you would work for a content company that would be totally different. Um, but despite everything we do in marketing, we have seven out of 4,000 people who do content editing. Got it. Whether it's audio, video, uh, we have more designers. Designers, we have a lot. Uh, designer, I think we have 70, something around 70, because we offer that as a service for a client. Because we have a, an app, which is a website builder. Uh, and, and it's part of our service to say, you want to improve the design, we can also do service on top of the website builder. You know Naval Ravikant? No. He's a big like uh, tech influencer on Twitter. And mm. he's, he's very big in America. So he has a saying and he's very respected in the tech community in America, especially, but also India now. Uh, he said that if you know how to code or if you know how to create good quality of content, then it's likely that you will make money in the future. Oh, yes. Yeah. Code, everyone understands like how you can make money. But do you agree with the content side of things that if you know how to make good quality content? It gets more difficult. I think the, in the early days, uh, a lot of successful uh, uh, artists or content creators um, that we started five, ten years ago, it was much easier. Today, it's more difficult, but it's still true. Um, the very good, best guys. But it's a bit. I believe it's a bit like a uh, sport. Only the top... Succeed yeah. to go out of the crow. Yeah, true. You're talking about content creation. Right? Yes. You're, you're not talking about content. Only really. the few percentage that are extremely good will make it a big business. Have you ever thought of what makes those few very good? Like in your eyes, what makes a good content creator? I'm not a good content consumer. So I don't know. Okay, I can, I don't watch that much. So things. fair to say that in your eyes, it's just numbers. The guys, because I'm assuming that that's usually. Uh, uh, let's speak about the do. Because I have a big content team, but uh, for or do not, we serve a different purpose. It's not about views, it's about helping the others, but still views <laughs> are useful for us. Um, for me, it's about educating. So the, the viewer should learn something, should have fun while he learns, but it should be better after having viewed the videos. I'm not so much about entertainment. There is a big business on entertainment, but uh, as a company, I really, what I really like is when we provide value. I used to say that developers, they create value. They create the value of the, in the product. Uh, marketing or content, they create the perception of the value. Mm. You can create the best value you want. If people don't understand it, uh, it's not a value because they won't use it. So you need, you need both. What have you picked up about content creation today? Um, a, a podcast or a interview sh show is similar to what we used to do in Europe. I feel like it's the same kind of discussion. Like you've done a podcast in Europe? Yes, yes, big ones, yeah. Okay. And they've asked you similar questions? Uh, no, not similar question, but um, the ideas are the same. If um, we have to be open, have a good discussions, um, uh, what interests people are the same, I think. How? They want to learn, have fun. How do I expand in Europe as a content creator? I think you are better at your, at your job than me. Huh? <laughs> I think you you better knows than me. How do I reach you as a view? How, how can more European people who are in positions of power get yeah. to know that I exist? Um, Maybe a way I'll rephrase that question is what do you guys need in terms of content? I think that uh, content creator, um, it's like product. It's something you build on the long term. You have to start small and acquire and acquire and acquire. Mm. There is no like, there is no magic formula of, oh, can I get one million of views mm. uh, directly? It doesn't work that way. 
you have to build, improve, improve, adapt to the audience. And it's because you do it for five to 10 years that it starts to get big. Um, audio the audience in Europe, for instance, or in America, it's difficult because, um, you know, the largest B2B uh, YouTube channel in Belgium is 20K subscribers. <laughs> Wow. So you as an Indian, you will be probably very frustrated in Europe, <laughs> mm. in Belgium. In France, it's a little bit bigger, but still we are not talking about the same number of, uh, of viewers. How do you look at the future of social media from your global perspective? Um, for Odoo as a brand, it's great. It's a way to educate people the way they, where they are, somehow on Instagram, on YouTube. But it's a way for us to distribute education and explain and teach, and teach to our community. <laughs> So in, in a way, it's very good. Um, yeah, it's good. What do you think is the future of social media in the world? Have you ever thought of this? Um, no, I've never told about this. I think it's bad for kids. <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure the future is, uh, maybe you, I don't know if you are at the top or if it will continue growing uh, in terms of uh, value it provides to humanity. Um, because obviously there is some drawbacks to it. Um, you know, the IQ, um, well, since we measure IQ, like 100 something years has always increased. Mm. Um, and there are a lot of people who have an IQ su superior to Einstein today. Um, uh, it always increased over the past, uh, five or 10 years. I, I don't know. It decreased. Uh, and social media is one of the two reasons uh, mm. about it. It's because when you always watch TV, spend time on social media or play video games, um, your your brain is not thinking, uh, and you are probably losing uh, ability to concentrate yourself. Do you play video games? No, not so much. I d I developed video games. I developed a lot, but I didn't play. Is there anything you do outside of work for fun? Uh, being with friend, party with friend, I like, uh, but I walk a lot, and because for me, work is fun. Um, I prefer to. I mean, work is for me is building things, creating things, innovation. This is super fun. It's um, problem solving. It's creative. It's uh, always different. It's very fun. I think very few people in the world find the thing that they were born to do. And you're one of those lucky guys. Yes. You're born to do exactly this job. Yeah, and you are probably one too. Yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, I really enjoy my job. Like, it gets a lot quantity-wise, you yeah. know? Like, it and, and being happy doesn't mean easy. So you have to walk a lot. You sometimes do things you don't like. You, But all in all, if you like the output of what you do, yeah. then you will be happy. Yeah. You know, I have not asked these kind of questions for a very long time on the show because there was a phase with this podcast where people wanted to know personalities and it was about self-improvement. Okay. And I've kind of removed those questions from the show and I've made it more about culture and, you know, the future. Mm -hmm. But when I meet people like you, I have to go back to that original set of questions mm -hmm. sometimes because you're very rare, you know, you've got material <laughs> success, but still personality is in the right place. Heart is in the right place, mm -hmm. which for me is like the most important, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I'm asking you this. And it's probably the last question of today. Tell me about like the worst moment of your life or the most painful moment or the moment you felt the most shame. Um, I've had very difficult times and usually these difficult times were very difficult on the moment, but I noticed a few years after that actually it was a good thing. I, I can give you a few examples. Uh, one of the very hard times is when I had a company, six employees, uh, five employees at the time and, um, three developers and, and one admin and, uh, and me and the three developers, they left at the same time. So from one day to another, I had nobody to deliver the service. I had to do everything myself for four people. And uh, they did that. And usually they did that by preparing uh, a product that is a competitor to do. It, it failed, but they did that. So a few months before, they stopped delivering service to clients. So I also had, at the same time, a lot of clients complaining that I have to satisfy myself. When it happens, I was like done. Very, very, very dumb. So it's very hard for me. I was like, how can I how old go back? Uh, I don't know, maybe 20, 27 or something. Uh, how do I get back to that? And, and then I walked and I walked. I recruited other people. And after that, like once the, the storm handed up, 
I, I noticed on my friend, actually, it was a good thing. I needed them to leave and to start with new employees. It was very difficult on the moment, but for the life, in the life of the company, that's been a good thing. Um, but you don't notice that when it happens. You only see it very closely, like, oh, I, no, I will suffer. I was already working 14 hours a day. No, I have to work even more and I will have angry customer and so on. But uh, it turns out to be a very good thing because it allows me to turn down the company, start again with people with a better mindset and, and do better things. Any other moment? Um, no, but it's the, 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 the key things to, re to, to get from that is that the most difficult times are usually what makes you better after or makes you learn something. Okay. Fabian, thank you. Thank you so much. That's Much all fun. I'll say. I asked you my own questions, man. Like yeah. I think India needed a bit of a global business perspective. Mm -hmm. First time we're doing that on the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, I enjoyed every bit of this conversation. Like, okay. There wasn't even one part where I got bored because you gave such different perspectives, man. Mm -hmm. So uh, usually at the end of my podcast, I compliment the guest on something I picked up about the person through the course of this episode. Mm -hmm. But I've already told you all my compliments. Yeah, you, you, you have to stop complimenting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been too nice to you. It's too much. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I really appreciate your time. Okay. That's the biggest compliment I can give you. I totally know how busy you might be. And all I'll say is this will add value to lives for like 10, 20 years at least. So thank you, Fabian. Thank you for having me. And we will see you very soon. Thank yep. you. That was the episode for today. Please go and follow Fabian on all his social media handles. I've linked it down below. I'd love for you guys to tell me what you thought of today's conversation. I absolutely adore doing business conversations. I love learning from people who aren't Indian because sometimes I feel like when you get to hear perspectives that are completely different from the perspectives we hear all around us. It forces you to question the stuff you've heard until that point. Of course, no one's completely right or wrong, but it's very, very important to get these kind of data points. So throughout these three hours of speaking with Fabian, I found my preconceived notions being a little bit challenged. The way I looked at business definitely changed after this conversation. The way I look at international expansion of my business has changed very drastically. So personally for me in this podcast, I gained value. I hope that this reaches the right audiences. I hope that every Indian entrepreneur comes across this conversation because I personally felt like there was a lot to learn as is the case with TRS always. Every conversation is an extraction of knowledge, data and experiences. Make sure you keep supporting. Make sure you check out our massive library of podcasts as well. TRS will be back soon. Ranveer will be back soon. And we'll bring you another explosive episode of The Ranveer Show.